Welcome to the Zweig Letter Podcast, putting architectural, engineering, planning, and environmental consulting advice and guidance in your ear. Zweig Group's team of experts have spent more than three decades elevating the industry by helping AEP and environmental consulting firms thrive. And these podcasts deliver invaluable management, industry, client, marketing, and HR advice directly to you, free of charge. The Zweig Letter Podcasts, elevating the design industry one episode at a time. Hey folks, and welcome to another episode of the Zweig Letter Podcast. I'm your host, Randy Wilburn, and I'm excited to be here today with you and I have another great episode. I got a chance to connect with my cousin from the north, Matthew Van Gilst from Calidus Engineering. And I- I'm joking when I say that, but I always refer to everybody in Canada as one of my cousins from the north. And we don't always get a chance to bring folks on from uh, from from Canada, but we've had others on the Zweig Letter podcast in the past. And I wanted to bring Matthew on to kind of talk about what they have been doing up at Calidus, uh, especially over these last, oh, I don't know, 18 months since we've been dealing with this pandemic. We are now at the time of recording this in early June of 2021, and it, it seems to be the um, the thawing out, if you will. And so without further ado, I just want to welcome Matthew Van Gilst from Calidus Engineering to this Wide Letter podcast. How are you doing? Great, Randy. Thanks to thanks for having me here. It's been great to be a guest. I've been a a long time listener, and it's uh, <laughs> fantastic to uh, get an opportunity to have a conversation with you. Right. Yeah. No, I know, and it's crazy because I remember you guys came. I want to say that I think you and maybe Jennifer Stanley or somebody and maybe one other person came to a principal's academy, and I can't remember what city that was in. Do you remember? Yeah, I think we we sent uh, we sent two batches of people. One one batch to Chicago. Right, that's um, right. And one batch and, to Baltimore. Yeah, that could have been it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that was so it. That was, that was part it. of uh, an ownership uh, transition uh, uh, initiative that we had on underway. And so we sent all of our new uh, owners to the Principals Academy uh, as yeah. part of their onboarding, so to speak. Yeah, and they're all doing well. I mean, Jennifer's the director of engineering at Calidus. I mean, yep. everybody has done extremely well. I, I've... I keep tabs on you guys from afar. Obviously, we have this thing called LinkedIn, which is really nice because it keeps us abreast of everything. But you guys are, are really doing it. Why don't you just um, real quickly for our audience, um, because I always like to introduce to them who they're who they're listening to and why they should be listening. But but just just give us the cliff note version of your superhero origin story and, and how you got to where you are now. Sure. Well, so uh, I think I got to go back all the way to uh, my university days. So I did uh, a mechanical engineering degree at the University of Waterloo, uh, and they've got a a co-op program. And so their whole scheme is you go to school for four months, then you work for four months, uh, and you graduate with uh, like two years of work experience. And so when I I came out of that, all my co-op terms had been – sort of in kind of industrial type environments, uh, manufacturing. And I came out of the, out of the program feeling like I didn't, that wasn't the spot for me. I didn't, I didn't want to work in that kind of environment. So when I graduated, I just started looking for jobs that weren't that um, and landed in the AEC space. Um, took a, took a job with a really small firm, you know, home-based business. Um, There's five of us when we, when I, when I started um, and, um, and really had no idea what I was, what I was getting into. Um, didn't really understand even HVAC or building construction and all that sort of stuff. But, but sort of six months into it, realized that I really enjoyed the work, enjoyed working with people, enjoyed, you know, that projects were always changing. You're always doing something new. Uh, and and really just sort of like latched onto it and said, yeah, let's 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 do this. Um, and uh, and so you know, fast forward um, after about five years of, of of doing that, and the the firm was growing. There was an opportunity. The firm that I was with uh, 
Grant Hall is, you know, our founder. Um, so he always worked with another firm. One was focused on mechanical, one was focused on electrical. And it made sense to put those two under one umbrella. And so at that in 2005, we, we joined those two firms to, together to form Calidus Engineering. And I had an opportunity to join in at an ownership level at that point in time. And so, um, yeah, so we had nine people on the first day of Calidus and we've just kind of grown. We're, we're 45 people now with, with two offices. Um, and, and so that whole period of, of growth as a firm um, has just provided incredible opportunities to, for me to grow as an individual with that and take on more responsibilities. And, and Grant Hall was uh, always a, you know, a, a type of leader who always let you do more. Um, you know, never pulled back on the reins um, and, and uh, all those opportunities to, to grow uh, were in, in great part due to, to sort of his approach that way. And um, yeah, so that's kind of where we, where we started and, and where we are today. Wow. Okay. And, and that is, what was the name of the other firm? So, so it was called JED engineering, which were okay. just the initials of, uh, of Grant's uh, kids. Cause he started the company <laughs> in, uh, in the nineties during the recession to put food on the table. Right. Right. Yeah. No, you'd be surprised. I mean, um, the, the, the what is it necessity is the mother of invention right, right. And so opportunities present themselves and you you know and that's actually what what we've kind of experienced over the last 18 months at the time of recording this is that a lot of firms a lot of design firms had ha, found new necessities and new ways of doing things and so you know i'd be curious to know what 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 have been some of the biggest learning lessons that Calidus has experienced? Because I know you and I, we've kind of gone back and forth via LinkedIn. We had originally talked about uh, some things early on, right before the pandemic just kind of shut everything down. And then that yeah. changed that changed focus for everybody. Certainly so I'd, I'd love for you to kind of talk about how it changed your focus and, and what you decided to double down on. Yeah. Well, so uh, there's a couple things that stand out. Um, in particular, you know, sort of remote uh, working. Obviously, everybody's gone through that transition. But what was really interesting from our side of things is, so we we you know, we're based in in London, Ontario. That's where you know we we started, um, and we opened up a second office, uh, another regional office in 2017. And so that's our Kingston office, and 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 they've grown and been successful. But that whole sort of inter office dynamics. Are, are are different, right? And and a, and a challenge, and um, and when uh, when everybody started working from home, that sort of like leveled the playing field, so to speak. Um, everybody was on the same playing field, which I just said, but same playing field in in terms of communication. There wasn't like the the dynamics of you know main office and remote office because everybody was working from home. And, and that really increased um, uh, the empathy for, for everybody um, and, and also improved our overall communications. And so that's been something that's really benefited us from, from uh, sort of pandemic tran- transitions. Um, and, uh, you know, we were, we were fairly well equipped to make that transition quickly from an IT side of things. Um, and so it was a pretty smooth transition, but it's definitely been eye opening. Um, and there's elements that we have to sort of take away from that and bring back, uh, you know, when things return to to normal, it's going to be it's going to a new normal. Right. And and uh, and we need to bring some of our lessons learned from that as well. Yeah. You know, and I, and I think those those of our those of us that here are live here in the United States, you know, we we had some of us have had a different experience during this pandemic. So for you guys and and prior to us recording, we were just talking and I was asking you about, you know, whether your kids were back in school and you reminded me that they weren't because nobody's been in school in Canada. And so you guys have kind of treated the pandemic a little differently. 
and your focus has been a little different and and you guys are just now starting to kind of come out of that right and yes. so what what has that been like for you and 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 uh are, are you physically back in your office right now yeah, I, I am i am physically back in our <laughs> office um I think as as a smaller company, there's a little bit more flexibility that way, and so we've we've been able to have you know some people, but we're only about uh, between you know ten and fifteen percent of our of our staff working working in the office and everybody else at home. But I think uh, what one thing that has been a challenge is the overall length of this um, pandemic, and. Um, uh, sort of not com- complacency or you kind of, you kind of at the very beginning, you know, there was an urgency, right. And needing to uh, uh, put in place new communication methods or, you know, make sure that everybody's doing all right. And over time, you kind of got a little bit tired of that and you forget about, you know, the importance and so, at, especially as as things have got you know improved and then declined and then improved and then declined, you kind of got a little tired of it. And I think as an organization, uh, we we did lose our our focus a little bit on uh, reacting or communicating with the same sort of sense of of, of urgency. Um, and so there's a there's an element of you know, remembering about the importance of persistence and sticking to things uh, in difficult uh, scenarios, but also a recognition that yeah, there's times where you get tired yeah. <laughs> because of yeah. the, uh, the, the strain we, you're under as well. Yeah, I think we all have pandemic fatigue. I, I think that's just a worldwide. <laughs> that's a worldwide thing. I'm tired of smelling my breath, um, <laughs> you know, with my mask on, and and it's just. Uh, Man, I don't know if I, I don't. I don't think I've gone through more Tic Tacs or um, spearmint gum and like uh, breath fresheners. I've discovered yes. a lot of things to help uh, help that, and and even essential oils to rub in the mask. So there's <laughs> there's all kinds of creative ways to not kill yourself on a regular basis. So, um, what what has it been like serving your clients though? Right? Because I mean, you know, work has still gone on. You guys have still been working. Yes. Clients still have needs, and and what is that? been like up there in Canada specifically for you guys yeah I think like the whole industry you know the transition to remote working uh, both from uh, you know engineering getting things done architects getting things done clients getting things done while you know while there was a bit of a, a lag at the early stages everybody's made that transition uh, really well um, and you know technology is, has helped incredibly I think um, we're missing some opportunities to uh, sort of develop relationships a little bit farther. Um, you know, people tend to you know come into the Zoom and then leave the Zoom, and there's less opportunity for the the informal conversations before before and after. Um, so I think I think we've we've missed some yeah, opportunities to grow some relationships. Um, but the transition to remote meetings has also been really beneficial from a efficiency side of things, you know, we would, um, you know, we've, we've cut out travel time, right? You know, we have a, a meeting on a, on a project where we have to you know drive two hours to get to the client's office. That's, that's gone now. Right. Uh, and, and um, it's another case of this pandemic kind of forcing everybody's hand to, a, uh, you know, to a, a direction that was already needing to happen. Um, and this was just sort of the, the impetus to make that actually uh, happen. I know we had, we had talked to uh, clients in the past about, you know, can we do remote meetings versus, you know, being all around the same table? And I think we can at least get, uh, I don't know, in many instances, you the, the same results with everybody remote as opposed to everybody sitting around the same table. Yeah. Yeah. And certainly nobody's suggesting that, that this changes the fact that, that being on site is important. 
um, both from a relationship standpoint, but then also from a design standpoint, yeah. right? And so yeah. folks have to get out, you, you know, you got, I know some of you that are listening to this have kind of really enjoyed the pandemic because you're not people, people, you're not people persons anyway. And you're like, you know what, Any, if, if I don't have to be in front of someone, if I can just be in front of a screen, I'm good. But the reality is, is that those of you that are part of the creation and, and upkeep and, and the design of the built environment, you, you, it's incumbent upon you to get out of your office to get away from your desk and go see the client go see the job site so um you know there's, there's kind of that you have to find that happy medium where you can where you can do both and and i think moving forward i think firms are going to find um they're going to uh, find more time in their day because of the way that they utilize meetings, um, virtual as well as meetings in person. And, and I, I just think it's going to create a whole lot of new opportunities for firms to be much more efficient. Yeah, I, I agree with that, Randy. Yeah. So, well, that's, that's exciting. So um, wh- how bullish are you about the future right now, uh, especially in Canada? Cause I mean, and I'll be honest with you. I mean, I'm, I'm aware of what's going on here. I'm sure you've heard our, our president has talked about doing a huge infrastructure bill, which, mm-hmm. you know, that anytime you hear the word infrastructure, yes. somebody in the design industry is going to make some money. That's okay. Right. That's just how yeah. it works. Yeah. And, and, and I don't know what, what uh, president um, Trudeau is doing up there, but uh, I'm curious to know what, what you how you guys are are eyeing like right now mm-hmm. as well as what the future is going to look like as we as we come out of this you know we're kind of like in our spring thawing mm-hmm. out of the pandemic what does that look like for you guys up in Canada and what are you bullish about yeah well I, I see you know there's sort of a market's in a, in a bit of a weird spot where there's still you know some uncertainty and and it seems to there's sort of uh, ups and ups and downs um there hasn't been the same sort of talk of infrastructure stimulus uh, in Canada as, as there has been in the U S um, but there has been a lot of um, sort of an ongoing equivalent to your uh, PPP uh, program. Um, and so that's really helped stabilize a lot of businesses. Um, we are seeing on the, commercial side of things and uh, to a smaller degree on the industrial side of things, you know, still quite a bit of, of slowdown and uncertainty about how things move ahead, but on the uh, institutional and educational and multi and residential in particular, there's still tons of growth. Um, and um, there's a lot of talk about how the, the market needs, you know, increased housing supply um, and so we see the multi-unit residential side of things uh, continuing to be strong for the foreseeable uh, future. The, all the talk is more about filling the gap of supply. Um, and so that, like you say, whenever there's sort of that talk of needing that, you know, needing built environment, then um, architects and engineers have, have work ahead of them. So it's a matter of when it happens, but it definitely is the need there for us to, to fill. Yeah. And and I know that the, the, the timber industry up there is big, but are you guys experiencing the crazy fluctuation in wood prices like yes. we are? Yes. I mean we're 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 seeing um we're seeing uh uh wood wood what is it? Um I, I keep forgetting, but uh, it, it's like the big sheets of wood yeah. uh, that are selling for like hundred yeah, big sheets of plywood that are selling yeah. for hundred and ten dollars a sheet, yeah. you know, before you could go into a, a Home Depot or a Lowe's and get them for basically nothing. But yeah. how how because I mean you guys have a huge timber industry in Canada. Yes. How yes. how how has that impacted you guys? We're we're seeing the same thing, the same okay. uh, skyrocketing um, supply prices, and it's but it's not just related to to wood. Um, I heard a couple of weeks ago there was issues with uh, ABS piping and supply, yeah, uh, and um, and that plumbers were actually being put on. Um, on quota limits in terms of the amount of ABS piping that they could they could buy uh, because there were supply issues and and so we've really seen a huge disruption to to supply chains and and there's keeps on being new things that crop up it makes it really difficult for for the constructors um, I've also heard of them um, uh, holding their prices for you know very short periods of time as opposed to you know the standard 30 or 60 days 
um, uh, just to try and mitigate some of that that price risk. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's. I think it's tough. It's. It's. I mean, it's tough all over. I mean, we're we're all dealing with the crunch. I mean, logistics and sourcing material and getting supplies. I think I had to wait. And I may have mentioned this before in a previous episode, but during the pandemic, I had to get a door frame replaced. It took me seven months for my guy to order it. I mean, he was ready to do it. He just couldn't, yeah. didn't have one available. It took seven months to get wow. it. It's, I, it was like crazy. I mean, it yeah. was just like, and that's just, that's, it, that's just a microcosm of the bigger problem. Yes. Yeah. yeah so, sure. you know, yeah, it's crazy. Well, before, when, when we were talking earlier, uh, one of the things that you did mention, which was a real benefit for you was, um, the, the fact that you really kind of doubled down in the area of like uh, personal and professional development. Um, I know you said that you had, um, you were able to, because it was virtual to attend and have a lot of your folks participate in the elevate uh, program yes. that Zweig did virtually for the first yeah. time because they yeah. couldn't have a face-to-face -face meeting. So right. could you talk about that and, and how that impacted your folks? Yeah, well, I think there's <clears throat> um, this pandemic has given uh, huge opportunities that way. Um, so I mentioned that, uh, Elevate, but we also participated in um, CXPS, um, uh, uh, seminar or conference put on by Client Savvy, all focused on uh, client experience. Um, and our uh, the SMPS has a, a chapter based in Toronto and the same sort of thing, you know, uh, we're two hours outside of Toronto, wouldn't participate in those events, but uh, they've gone all virtual as well. Uh, and we also participated in like an ownership transition symposium, where you know firm leaders from across North America, there's maybe about a dozen of us, you know, talking through the uh, particulars of our situation and and um, you know what people's struggles were and ideas and and so it's just been a fantastic opportunity in a in a really difficult situation to to uh, to rub shoulders virtually with yeah. with people. Yeah. Um, the Elevate program. Um, you know, there's so much great, great content um, that Zweig has put out. We attracted some great speakers. Uh, we probably had uh, you know half a dozen of our of our team participate uh, in various um, various of the sessions. Mark uh, talking about the uh, board of directors and what not to do. Uh, was a really uh, there's some really great lessons to be learned there, and so yeah, it was fantastic for us to have that opportunity. Like to to be honest, Randy, you know, we probably wouldn't have made a trip. We haven't in the past, you know, made a trip to to participate in in a conference like that. Um, and so uh, now now that we have experienced that, I think there's also an element of us being more willing to entertain that in the future as well right we've absolutely. seen how good it can be yeah 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 absolutely I, and i'm glad you said that i think a lot of people feel that way because there were a lot of people that participated in the elevate program that had actually hadn't had just maybe maybe read the newsletter the zweig letter uh maybe had heard of mark or chad or jamie claire or some of the other um um, principles at Zui Group, but um, you know, I mean, it, it's it was a chance for people to, without a lot of um, skin in the game, if you will, to kind of yeah. kind of test the waters and see what was going on. And I think the results and the feedback was um, 100% positive. I think people were like, "Man, I, I was able to get my whole team." On several uh, on se at several sessions, and we all sat down and kind of talked about it. And I'm curious, what did you guys do, or what what have you been doing when you've gone through a virtual training, whether it's Zweig or any other? Do you guys kind of come back and, and and dialogue about it afterwards? Yeah, it, it, you know, depending on the topic, uh, you know, if it's particularly to like a uh, design side of things, you know, so the mechanical team is talking through what they've learned. Our leadership team is talking through uh, what we've learned in in uh, you know, some of the Elevate sessions, um, and then also you know using snapshots from that um, through we using uh, Microsoft Teams as our sort of communication platform, you know sharing snapshots just with the whole company as well in terms of uh, you know passing on information, passing on learning, and getting people 
to see, you know, what's out there as well um, in terms of the whole you know, design industry and what resources there are, but also thinking about, um, you know, more than just uh, focus on your, your projects as well, right? Yeah. 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 No. It, it. Yeah. And it. It does create some really cool opportunities. I think uh, for for firms to to kind of work on those things. Um. You know, when we spoke a while back, you had um, you had mentioned to me one of your desires was to really create opportunities to develop your folks, and and one way that you wanted to do that was through mentoring. And I'd love for you just to kind of speak to what what you view as the importance of mentoring within the framework of a design firm, and uh, and and what has mentoring meant for you? Mm-hmm. Well, I think there's a couple of really uh, fantastic e- examples. I, I remember on your other podcast, Randy, when you when you interviewed uh, Ellen Bensky, and she yeah. talked about the uh, their plus one program, that whole. Um, intentional methods to pass down learning from experienced folks to people who are new in their career. And that's, that's really critical. Uh, And, and as a, as a firm, you know, we're right in the thick of that um, in terms of needing to get better at that in terms of transitioning information, uh, you know, in, in great part, because we have a lot of, you know, Rel- people who are relatively new in their career, and we have a lot of, well, we have some really key people who have um, lots of experience, and we we need to get that transitioned out. Um, and so, finding those opportunities to pair them up on on job assignments, but also, you know, the the permission to you know not be focused on like um, the scope of the project, but the the learning opportunity that has to happen as well. Um, I think we're still searching for some some uh, creative ways and some really effective ways to, to do that on, on a regular uh, basis. We we have a we have a project that is literally uh, 200 yards from our from our office now. It's a a eight story apartment building that they're just getting in the ground on. Um, that's one of ours. And so that's going to be a prime opportunity for us to get on site because it's literally you can go there on your lunch break and walk through the site. And so we're really uh, priming to have that as a great learning opportunity for people to get out there with senior people uh, really seamlessly and, and build into each other that way. Yeah, I, I I I love hearing that because that is important, and and you you are it's fortunate that you have it right there in your own backyard, if you yes. will, right? And yeah. I think people need to understand that the uh, the knowledge transfer in the design industry space, and what I mean by that simply is that your ability to take those and we'll, we'll use this phrase, those graying individuals, right? Or those sages, those individuals that have been there, done that, have forgotten more than most people know about a specific vertical or, or, or section of the market. Mm-hmm. Um, you need to be able to put them in positions to be able to transfer their knowledge um, because we haven't figured out a way to create a USB connection to right. our brains <laughs> and download all that information, including the stories and experiences. Yeah. So you need to, and I'm saying you to anybody, any professional listening to this that works in an organization that's, that considers themselves to be thriving, you need to be proactive about creating opportunities, those mentoring, mentee opportunities for that knowledge transfer to take place. I believe it is one of the biggest challenges that this industry faces because our industry is graying and we're we're losing experts on a regular basis, not to death, but to retirement and, mm-hmm. you know, wherever Phoenix or Miami or wherever people are going when they, you know, when they hang it all up and decide to uh, to no longer practice engineering or architecture. But I think it's incumbent upon firms to be very proactive in this area. Uh, would you agree with that? I totally do. Totally do. You know, I, I see it ourselves and, and uh, in you know our, our peer firms and our clients as well. Uh, we, we need, there's a great need and there's great opportunity there that uh, can really, you know, firms that can do it well will set themselves apart as well from, yeah. from, from attracting talent side of things too. 
Absolutely. Absolutely. So, I mean, and, and it really, a lot of times people are wondering, well, what, what does that look like or how do we do it? I think it's really simple. If you ask me, if, if I were going to bullet point it out, I'd say you've got a couple of things that a, a design firm should consider. A, um, every design firm has a story to tell, right? And the young people need to learn that story. You know all the stories about how things began because you were there in 2005. Right. Yes. But people that, that, that Jennifer hired just in the last two years may not know all those stories. So you've got to tell those stories. Yeah. Then you've got to talk about some of your worst experiences, right? Because as a, as a design professional, you've had some really bad outcomes. Yes. We, we all have. <laughs> and, and, and so you have to talk about that. You have to be willing to kind of share and, and, and bear your soul, if you will, because if young people, specifically young uh, Gen Z or millennials that are at, on the younger side of the spectrum, don't see the 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 fact that this is not a um, that is not a zero sum outcome, and that that there there is room to make a mistake and 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 live to tell the story, mm-hmm. all of that needs to be captured and told. Agreed. And those are the things. A lot of times, firms will. And then, and then, and then the next thing would be just to extol all of the successes and wins, right? So when you think about all the wins that a company has, like I'm, I'm still amazed that companies don't even celebrate when they get a new project and there's, you know, and there's no, there's no custom around it. There is, I mean, it's just like, it's like, it's common. It, it, well, it's not common sense because if it was common sense, everybody would be doing Mm -hmm. it, but it's one of those things where it's like, come on. We've got to be able to do that. We've got to celebrate it. If you go out and get a new job, we've got to celebrate it. The younger people see it and they're like, man, I want to do what Matthew just did. Mm -hmm. If you make a mistake, you got to tell that story so the young people can say, okay, I I know that I might make this mistake, but it's not as bad as I thought because Matthew made that same mistake. (laughs) And, you know, you just keep going on from there. But I I mean, and then I think it's important to tell those anecdotal stories because honestly, that's what really moves the needle. You could, you could, you could, you know, him and haw and, and, and pontificate about facts and, and, and statistics and figures, but people never remember any of that. Mm-hmm. And I would save that for the project itself. But when it comes to really developing your folks and really encouraging the leadership to transfer that information to the younger folks, think of it in those different buckets. And are you pouring enough into each of those buckets in order to be successful? So... Yeah, I think those are some really great points there, uh, Randy. I know uh, I would I would not say we are a firm that models the celebration side of things uh, very well, um, and it is one of those things we talk about. Uh, you know, we we celebrate we celebrate individuals really well. You yeah. know, uh, birthdays, uh, family celebrations, uh, uh, career milestones, that sort of thing. But yeah. from a what we've accomplished as a, as a firm, we, we've got some, we've got some work to do that way for sure. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, one of the things I remember Mark in the back in the day when I was at Zweig White and Associates, and this was in the nineties, we had a gong every time anybody, yeah. I mean, it didn't matter. We, look, we sold 10 books. We hit the gong. We <laughs> got a new recruitment contract. We hit the gong. We, yeah. you know, I mean, it didn't matter what it was, a, an yeah. M&A project. We hit the gong and, mm. and it, it's just, it becomes part of the culture. Yes. Right. And so it's just you're like, OK, well, I got to celebrate. This is something that we did. And I get mm-hmm. it. A lot of design professionals are listening to this saying, no, I just you know, I just put my head down and get my work done. And that's all well and fine. But you still have to acknowledge mm-hmm. and see the progression that you're making, because if you just go from one project to the next to the next, you'll never see the progression. You'll just be like, oh, I'm just doing a lot of work. And I think it's just important. And so my encouragement to you and to everybody else is to go get a gong or (laughs) something that makes a loud noise that you can that you can share with everybody. And if you have multiple offices, get multiple gongs. We used Mm -hmm. to have a gong in San Francisco when I when I worked at Zweig White and Associates. Uh, We had a gong in the D.C. office. So everywhere that there was an office. Yeah, there was a gong and we would hit that thing when we got a new job and we would, you know, and nowadays with social media, because this was all pre social media. Yeah. You know, it, that was the extent of it. Now, you know, you hit the gong, you put it up on Instagram or somewhere like that. People can see, oh, man, these guys must be doing something. And then all of a sudden, one of your former clients sees it and says, man, those guys over at Calidus are busy. I need to give them a call. I need some more work done, mm-hmm. you know, and you, it, it just it, it, it kind of takes on a life of its own, but it doesn't happen through inertia. It happens through intentionality. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, no, so. that's, that's really good. That's a really good example there, Randy. Yeah, so yeah. that's 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 my two cents. So I'll, I'll get Not off my show. I'll get off my soapbox now. So, well, man, is there is there anything else that you would like to share with the listening audience? Maybe to any of your peers up there in Canada, or even to folks down here, um, a word of encouragement or anything that you'd like to share with uh, any other design firm professionals, design firm leaders. Well, I, I think I would just really like to give you some appreciation, Randy. Um, you know, it has been a fantastic journey listening to, you know, your podcast. And I appreciate everything that Zweig has done to elevate the industry and build into the, the AEC space. I remember, you know, we, we, when I first got uh, exposed to Zweig, back when it was Zweig White, you know, we subscribed to, to the Zweig letter and, and, you know, turning it into something free. First, my thought was like, wow, you know, there's a ton of value in there that you're just giving away. Yeah. And, and that has been so beneficial to us as a firm um, and, and to our staff who have got to learn from the wisdom of your whole team uh, I think it's really beneficial to to our whole industry. And uh, I just say thanks. Yeah, no, I, I really appreciate that. Yeah, you know, it's it's so funny. I've, I've told people that, you know, sometimes it, you know, changes good, right? And, and, you know, a lot of people don't know this, but the Zweig letter back in the day, like when I was at Zweig White and Associates, it was a, it was a $1 million line of revenue. I mean, so it was, it was big, but, but, you know, the internet changed all of that, you yeah. know, Matthew, and, and honestly, information is readily available at all times. And so I think the goal has been at Zwei Group is, is to get that information into as many hands as possible, right? I don't necessarily have to convert you by having you purchase the newsletter, but I can get you, I get, get your eyeballs, get you to be thinking differently about things. And mm -hmm. that's, that's one way that Zwei Group has tried to elevate the industry. Yeah. And, and I certainly applaud what Chad and Jamie Clare and the rest of the folks there are doing. Chad Coldiron, Phil Kyle, Will Swearingen, um, uh, they, they are doing, they are doing, um, a, a yeoman's task in an industry that is, it's it not, I won't, it's not an industry rife with problems, but it is an, an industry ripe for improvement. Agreed. That's, that's it. That's yep. it. Cause I, I, you know, and I tell design professionals every day and you probably are, some of your folks heard me say this. I say it every time I say, listen, what you guys do on a regular basis is some of the most important work in our society. Um, you need to be recognized for it and you need to remember it individually. Right. I think, and I think your team at Calidus needs to understand that the work that they're doing is critically important. And as a society, as, as a country, as countries, we can't move forward without, um, the skill set and the, um, imagination that you guys bring to the table when you design great things. So, yeah, I, I totally agree. Yeah, yeah. So, okay. All right. Well, we, we can end this love fest because I, mean, I could go on and on with that, but no, I, 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 uh, I, I appreciate you doing that real quickly. What, what is, have you read a book recently that has really moved you? Uh, maybe a book that's helped you in business? Well, so I was reading this weekend, um, uh, deep work. Uh, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. And that's, and, that's a good book. Oh man. Uh, <laughs> I've read it twice. Yeah. Well, we're, 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 we're so inundated with, uh, distractions. Um, the, the thing that I read this past week and that really stuck with me was, uh, was talking about, you know, sort of context switching and how, when you move from one task to the other, your brain is still working on that previous task. And, um, you know, sort of totally driving inefficiencies and, and we're surrounded by it. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. you, you have never lied, man. And that, that is, uh, that is, first of all, Cal Newport wrote the book. I, I would yeah, encourage right. anybody and we'll put that in the show notes. We'll put all of, you know, Matthew's information in the show notes so you can reach out and connect with him, find out what Calidus is doing. Maybe you're a firm that wants to get up there and do some work in Canada or just learn more about what's happening up there, uh, in the North. I, I would, I would certainly encourage you to check that out. But Cal Newport's book, Deep Work is excellent. I've list, I've read the book. I've listened to the audio book a couple of times. It and it is transformational from a mindset of 
I, you know, we're, we, we, a lot of us, not everybody, but a lot of us are doing it all wrong, wrong when it comes to work <laughs> and, and how we can really benefit from much more meaningful, impactful work that we can do in shorter periods of time. And like you said, that switching, it's hard for our minds to turn off. That's why I use the Pomodoro method when I work. And I typically work for about 40 to 45 minutes. And then I either take a 15 or 20 minute break. Then I come back and do the same thing. I also focus on working during the times of the day when my body is ripe for work, like really good work. Like at seven o'clock at night, I'm, I'm no good to anyone mm -hmm. when it comes to like any hardcore work, but from like five in the morning to 11 or 12, I'm good to go. And that's really where I put my time in. And so uh, I think you, it, it's incumbent upon you to learn when you work the most efficient. There are people that work better in the evening. Yeah. Um, so, you know, it just there's a whole there's a there's, I could get into a whole bunch of the different studies about our 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 our, our brains and, and how we operate, how our, our chronotype, what our chronotypes are. But the bottom line is once you learn about that and understand it and then apply some of the principles in Cal's book, Deep Work, yeah. um, you could find yourself working so much more efficiently that. What you used to get done in 40 hours, you'll, you'll start getting done in 30. Yeah. And then all that means is that you have more time available. And maybe that's more time to get more clients. Maybe it's more time to spend time with loved ones or family. You know, I mean, Matthew's got three boys. I've got three boys. I'd love to be out on the soccer field with them as much as possible or at a play or whatever. So all of this stuff that we're talking about here allows you to be more efficient in what you're doing on a regular basis. And then that that in turn can translate into more time with your family, more time with your loved ones and more time sitting around the table with some of your peers in your company, dreaming up new ways to serve the marketplace or, or taking time to celebrate. There you go. There you go. That's it. That's it. If people want to connect with you, what's the best way for them to do that, Matthew? Uh, LinkedIn would be the best. Okay. Okay. Just we'll put that for, link for Matthew there. Van Gilston. Put that link in the in the show notes for sure. Yeah. Well. Yeah. We will. We will definitely do that. Uh, man, this has been a treat. I'm so glad you agreed to come on and and you trusted me that I was going to take good care of you. So thank you so much for coming on. Please tell the rest of the team that we said hello. Uh, we that. appreciate you guys and and so glad that Canada is is coming out uh, of this pandemic, just kind of like we are here in the States. And, and, uh, and man, I wish you guys nothing but the best. Well, thanks a lot, Randy. It's been great talking with you. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, folks, that's another episode of the Zweig Letter Podcast. Uh, to learn more about one of the oldest newsletters in the design industry by visiting the Zweigletter.com. You can read articles online, listen to this podcast and sign up for a free subscription, just like what Matthew was talking about to the newsletter and have it delivered right into your email inbox every Monday morning. Sign up today. For more info about Zwei Group's advisory services or any Zwei Group publications, visit ZweigGroup.com. You can subscribe to the Zwei Letter podcast wherever you listen to it. And please consider rating and reviewing us on Apple Podcasts. I'm your host, Randy Wilburn, and we'll see you soon. Peace. Thanks for tuning in to the Zweig Letter Podcast. We hope that you can be part of elevating the industry and that you can apply our advice and information to your daily professional life. For a free digital subscription to the Zweig Letter, please visit thezweigletter.com slash subscribe to gain more wisdom and inspiration, in addition to information about leadership, finance, HR, and marketing your firm. Subscribe today.